I am so honored to introduce Terry Evans, an artist of national distinction. Once we learned about this latest body of work by Terry Evans, we simply knew that we needed to find the way to have it happen here in Wichita first. Um, this is its debut showing at the Ulrich Museum uh, of Art. And, and I would also like to acknowledge we have quite a nice contingent from Matfield Green that is here this evening. <laughs> And I'm going to make you applaud again because um, you know we all come to art and we bring our own perspectives. My own personal star of the exhibition is Toots Conley, and she's here tonight, um, right before us. Toots, please stand so we can acknowledge you. She came to the opening. She's come back, I think, twice. She's here tonight. She's just this soulful, incredible incredible character who's this amazing Mattfield Green resident. At any rate, um, before I uh, make a segue to introducing Terry Evans, I want to acknowledge a couple of people um, around the room. And I want to start with our partnership with the Wichita Art Museum. And I know we had some staff members from there that were here before. Oh, here we go. Steven Gleisner, the chief curator over in the corner. Um, this is. <clears throat> I've been here um, in Wichita and at the Ulrich for almost five years. This is the third time that the two art museums across town have linked arms to do a symposium, and all of you are the beneficiaries of the people that we bring together and the dialogue that we make happen, and it's just been a great partnership. So we started last evening at the Wichita Art Museum. We had the full day and now this evening of presentations here, and of course you're all going to come back starting at 1 o'clock tomorrow afternoon for a slate of three speakers there. So I want to acknowledge that. And I, I need to recognize the important patrons who make many great things happen at the Ulrich Museum here at Wichita State, but gave very generously to make the exhibition of uh, Terry's latest body of work happen. So um, you'll need to bear with me because there were many people who were generous and stepped forward including Richard Smith and Sandra Langle, Dr. John and Nancy Bramer, Ed and Helen Healy, Denise and Rex Irwin, Paul and Peggy Stevenson, Ron and Lee Starkle, Joe and Mary Stout, Keith and Georgia Stevens. And additionally, we had three corporate exhibition sponsors, and they included Emprise Bank, Fleece Going Attorneys at Law, and Spirit Era Systems, who's just just been a star for us in recent years and very generous with support of exhibition projects that uh, we've been able to develop and bring to Wichita. <clears throat> in introducing Terry, I want to start at the very beginning, um, which goes right to the beginning, which is that she was born in Kansas City, and she then went to the University of Kansas she moved to Salina following her husband and his family and lived there for several decades. And then, oh gosh, you know, don't blink, it's already been 20 years she's been living in, and has been based in Chicago. In terms of publications, Terry has five books on her work, four of which connect to her core content, which is the Midwestern Prairie. And since she is so connected to Kansas and lived here for several decades, listen to these book titles to give you a sense of her commitment. Book titles and exhibition catalog titles. From Prairie to Field, The Inhabited Prairie, Prairie, Images of Ground and Sky, The View from Here, Lure of the Local, Plain Pictures, meaning the plains, between Home and Heaven, Kansas Album. What an illuminating string of titles about this artist's particular life's passion and commitment. So as we've been exploring localism in this symposium and thinking about the possible meanings of place, of course it needed to connect with Terry's work and 
the central position that the prairies ha have occupied for her, but also with the current exhibition, The Flint Hills. Terry's honors are many and well-deserved. In 2001, when the Nature Conservancy was doing a project about the last great places and commissioned photographers to e explore them, Terry, of course, was selected, and she was in an elite roster with such photographic greats as Annie Leibovitz, Lee Friedlander, Sally Mann, and esteemed others. The Guggenheim Foundation gave her its very prestigious award in 1996. She is working with the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kansas City to develop her retrospective, which will open next fall. And of course, we're all hopping in our cars and driving there to be at least part of the opening and going back to its many programs. <clears throat> and yet, these are Matfield Green images and Flint Hill images that we're celebrating in the current exhibition. And they have struck a chord and they've touched an emotional wellspring tapped into so many of our visitors and we've had a whole fall of watching people um, really become quite emotional at times in our galleries it's been so rewarding and we've also had the reward of absolutely fabulous attendance this is one of our best attended falls in recent history um, at the Ulrich Museum thanks to these poignant images that Terry has captured and brought to all of us please join me in welcoming the very gifted and soulful Terry Evans to the stage Okay, is my mic on? I think it is. Um, well, it will be pretty hard to live up to that introduction, but um, I have to say it has been such a joy to work with Patricia and with the whole staff here. And uh, I feel that uh, I've, been, I've had the opportunity in working with them to work with some of the some of the many really great people who are contributing to the River of Art in Kansas, uh, which, which I hope will have public funding restored soon so that art can keep reaching. <laughs> so that art can continue to reach in all the little nooks and crannies of Kansas. Um, because there are so many people like Patricia who are working so hard to make that happen. Um, I also want to thank um, Nancy and Bob, whose presentations I heard this afternoon. They were very inspiring. And, um, and now we'll talk about me. Uh, um, I did grow up next door in Kansas City, Missouri, so we won't talk about that part. We'll talk about when my journey started here in Kansas. And it was, um, well, I did go to KU, and that's where I met um, my husband. And we got married in 1968, and we moved to a farmhouse uh, north of Salina. And after growing up in Kansas City, this was a new experience for me that I didn't, I didn't really know if I would like it or not. And as the wind would whistle around that farmhouse, every morning Sam would get up and he would look out the window and he would say, isn't it a gorgeous day? That happened all winter. That happened all the time. And it took. It took. I became a convert. And, uh, and I loved living out there and, uh, and I loved all of my years in Kansas. And that connection has not been broken because um, now Sam and I own that farmhouse and it's where we come on vacation. There are not many people in Chicago who come to Kansas in the middle of July or August for vacation. <laughs> but we do with, with great uh, pleasure. Um, and we're, you know, we're kind of hoping not too many other people discover it. So. Um, because part of the pleasure is being here and being able to see the open sky. And um, you know, it's, 
I never thought I would be a landscape photographer, but it was here that I learned to see land and, uh, and to see sky. But I'm going to start back in um, the early 70s. Um, because I grew up in Kansas City, I grew up in a, a middle class neighborhood, and uh, I really wanted to know what the conditions of poverty were like. Uh, what the, because, uh, because I was curious, and part of the uh, great thing about being a photographer is that um, it, has, it has allowed me to find out about things that I didn't know anything about. It has, it has allowed my curiosity to simply go into many, many places. And so um, the pictures, I'm just going to show you a few pictures from that very earliest work. Um, this was taken in Lawrence, Kansas in 1972. So, so this was um, not that long after the deaths of the uh, Kennedys and of Dr. King. And uh, I thought this child presented a real, um, a real figure of hope. And, uh, and I, just, I just came across this picture again recently. This one of this, um, this girl who is blind um, holding a radio. This is in Kansas City, Kansas. And this one also in Kansas City, Kansas. I worked with several um, grassroots, what we called then grassroots anti-poverty agencies. And um, President Johnson had started what he called the War on Poverty. And we thought in those days that that was a war we would win and fairly soon, and we haven't won it yet. And uh, I was fortunate to work with an agency called Crosslines in Kansas City, Kansas, and with um, an agency in Salina, and one in Lawrence, and, uh, and one in Brookville, Kansas. And I would visit people and get to know them, photograph them, and then bring them back photographs and photograph some more. and. Uh, and, and I, was, I was fortunate as a photographer to have this be my uh, first experience of doing serious photography because I was really, I was so deeply interested in the stories of the people that I was meeting. And I didn't realize at the time that these were probably the most accessible people I would ever meet because they didn't have anything to protect. And they were very open with their stories. So, um, so it, was, it, was, um, it was a wonderful collaboration. This is a woman in, Brookville, in um, Belleville, Kansas. Uh, my next project was um, uh, called No Mountains in the Way, where I worked with the uh, then curator of photography at the uh, Spencer Museum of Art. And this was in 1974 and was a documentary project um, and one of um, your um, truly great photographers, Larry Schwarm uh, from Wichita, uh, was, I worked with him on this project too. And um, I don't know if any of you know the Farm Security Administration photographs of, uh, for example, Dorothea Lang and Walker Evans, but if you do, you will uh, recognize that Dorothea Lang was, uh, was my idol. Um, it's a little embarrassing how much this, uh, this is a, a very strong tribute to her. Um, so I'm just going to go through um, these rather quickly. This farm crew is still one of my favorite pictures. This one taken actually at, at uh, uh, north of Salina where we were living. And this is in uh, Burns, Kansas. And this one in uh, Ellsworth. I really love the patterns in this, all the different patterns in the dresses and on the floor and in the wallpaper. Um, this was uh, another project called the Kansas Album Project. And this project, the support for this project originated here in Wichita with um, funding from Fourth National Bank and then in a, more, in a broader way from the Kansas Bankers Association, and uh, this involved um, seven or eight photographers. I organized the project, 
And uh, my contribution was um, uh, portraits of Kansas people. This is the Reverend Lewis Dale, who was at uh, First Presbyterian Church in Salina. And um, um, I just forgot his last name, although I know it. I mean, his first name, but his last name is uh, Creech. And he was also in Salina. And so I quickly moved through what was 10 years of, um, of photographing people and assuming that that was what I would always be doing. And then uh, my friend Wes Jackson introduced me to the prairie. And for the first time, it seemed um, interesting to me to look at land and landscape. And I started looking at the native prairie um, near Salina and uh, recording some um, research work that the Land Institute was doing on a nearby virgin prairie. And I started looking at the ground in early spring, and I, I, could, I was just stunned by what I saw on the ground, the tremendous diversity and complexity of, of the growth of a virgin prairie, and to see it emerge in the spring. And um, it was so different from my front yard or from a monocultural wheat field, for example, that uh, I was transfixed. And for the next year, I went there as often as possible and made um, something like um, something like 5,000 negatives of the ground. And finally, uh, I, I didn't actually get tired of this because every, everyone was different. I was always working at knee level, I mean with, at waist level with um, my camera pointed straight down using the same lens and trying to photograph on overcast days so that I would be seeing the biological structure and not some composition that I had made up. Um, so finally, I realized, well, if I start using color, it would show more information about the prairie. I was interested in this um, possibility of, of giving actual biological information about this ecosystem. And, but I was also interested in art. And so I thought that this uh, structure of sort of flattening out the space, first by looking down and then later by looking across uh, at, a, at the far horizon that Kansas affords us, um, that I could flatten out the space and it would, it would be closer to a time in art history um, when there was a world view that actually worked in a way, in a, in a way like an ecosystem. In that, the viewer um, in these early um, ancient cave paintings or in um, Chinese scrolls or in Indian miniatures, the viewer is embedded within the picture frame and not standing outside looking at something receding in the distance as happened uh, later in, in with the onset of the Renaissance and the development of linear one-point perspective. So I was interested in uh, photographing the prairie in a way that seemed to me to be um, this um, more ecological point of view. And um, so I continued photographing the prairie and, um, and trying to flatten out the space while also giving full attention to what was really there. And I gradually um, uh, started photographing also the um, animals and um, of the prairie. This, this is actually one of my favorite pictures because uh, these bison look so ancient. This was a snowy day, and this was at Roxbury Game Preserve, and the um, man who took me out was the manager of the game preserve. And when I saw the bison group like this, I jumped out of his truck and went over quickly and made the shots. And, and when I got back in the truck, he said, you know, I never would have, I never would have gotten that close to them. So <laughs> I was really glad he didn't tell me that beforehand because I got the picture I wanted. And 
And so I tried to work in all seasons. And then um, we, we heard earlier about the importance of fire on the prairie. And this was um, important to me to include also. In fact, I loved it. And, um, and then um, this sage coming up reminded me of stars. And I realized that the sky was part of the prairie. So I started photographing the sky, too, and then doing some aerial views so that I could, I could find out, is it really true that it looks the same from above as it does from this waste level perspective? And then uh, I finally left the prairie as, uh, or the uh, virgin prairie as a subject in, um, uh, I don't know, I can't remember exactly, but in the mid-80s, and um, groped around for what to do next. But I still was so interested in the prairie. And finally, uh, finally I came to accept that, um, that the prairie included all of this human-changed prairie, too. It, it, uh, it wasn't just this minuscule portion of virgin prairie. And so, it seemed to me that if I were to photograph the human inhabited prairie, I would need to go higher because um, we humans tend to simplify the patterns on the prairie. If we look at the ground, we don't see 150 different species of uh, plants on the ground. We see you know, whatever we have put there. And so I thought if I could go to the aerial perspective, that would, um, that would give um, give me a better sense of the relationships and how the interrelationships on the ground, the, the human patterns and marks on the ground. So that one was uh, Saline County. This one also. I photographed for about four years um, with doing aerial photography just in an area that was about a 30 mile radius around where I lived in Salina. And, uh, and again, the burning from the air. And this is the um, Canopolis. This is a, a um, quarry at Canopolis, Lake Canopolis. And then, and, and I guess uh, I, I started working in color, and then I switched to black and white. It seemed to me that the color was sort of distracting for seeing the structure of the patterns. This is um, um, that. Um, Park by Lindsberg. What is the name of that? Um, Coronado. Coronado Heights. Thank you. It's Coronado Heights. And looking across uh, Saline County. And uh, another one of my favorites, this, um, this um, cemetery that is now in the middle of what I think is a wheat field and was very hard to find on the ground. You just see that tiny access road up at the top. And this, uh, this Solomon River and an oxbow formed by heavy rains, uh, forming, uh, filling in the old course of the river. Um, cattle feedlot, uh, rock quarry. Now, I put this in. Almost no one except me has been interested in this picture. But here's why I like it. I love how the road and the sky are exactly the same value of gray. And so, it becomes sort of this one shape with the, uh, the vultures taking off in the middle. And this is the uh, site of, of an, early, um, an early Native American village site uh, because we found um, artifacts there um, below the curve of the trees. OK, I'm going to speed up here a little bit so that I um, don't take all evening. Um, but, I, but I do have to tell you about these curving uh, lines here. By This is a, seria, a cemetery at Asaria. And if you, I don't know, can you see those just curving lines? Um, one of the things I love about aerial photography is that um, there's so much that is revealed to me later in the image that was not visible to me when I took the picture. So when I look with a magnifying glass, I see the single tracks of a deer have made those beautiful curving lines. This uh, water tower in Saline County. And now, um, now I'm bringing you into Chase County and um, 
and we're heading towards um, Matfield Green. Um, Wes Jackson also introduced me to the town of Matfield Green, and I almost immediately fell in love with it and started coming over from Salina as uh, often as possible. And very early in my visits, I met um, my friend Toots, um, actually at the Hitchin Post Bar one, one evening. And we um, became good friends, and she was so hospitable to me. And, uh, and so that friendship has meant a lot to me over the, it, I photographed there often over the next um, eight years. And even moved my darkroom there into the basement of the old school. But then, a few years after Sam and I moved to Chicago, um, my life in Chicago overtook me. And I didn't go back again to Matfield Green for about 10 years. And then I did go back about three or four years ago and started photographing again. And so the exhibition here now is the um, resolution of, of all of that work over that now spans a period of uh, 20 years. And uh, I'm very thrilled with the exhibition here. It's just, it's been uh, such an honor to be able to show this whole body of work in such a beautiful space and in such a beautiful way. So uh, I am, I'm deeply grateful. Um, when I first came to Matfield Green, there were falling down houses. There's not nearly that many now. Um, but I was so fascinated. I was in the middle of making a transition to Chicago. I didn't want to leave Kansas, but of course I wanted to be with Sam. And so um, this loss and these stories that seemed to me to be embedded in the layers of leaves and cloth and um, and abandoned things in these houses spoke very strongly to me. Also, Matfield Green reminded me very much of a little town where my grandmother lived up in North Missouri, which I visited often as a child, and I thought it was the most magical place in the world. And so it was, it was kind of a, in an odd way, a coming home. Um, I love this um, picture of these, uh, I mean, I love this closet. Because the only thing, hang the, I didn't move anything. So here was this um, waitress dress and this cowboy shirt, and there seemed to be a ballad embedded in that closet. <laughs> just, just said that's not her closet. No, her closet, I've never seen her closet, but I'm sure it's very nice. I have more to say about toots later. Um, so I don't know if you can see Mr. Lawrence reading the newspaper in the window. One thing I like about this picture is how it has kind of the same scale as some of my um, aerial pictures. And I lived, um, when I would go to Matfield Green, I lived in the um, old hardware store upstairs, which um, now has been converted into a lovely home um, whose owner is here, I think, tonight. And, but at the time, it belonged to the Land Institute, and it was sort of a dormitory, and I had a room there, and this is my view looking out the window. That is actually the Hitchin Post bar next door. Um, and the school was then abandoned. Um, later, the Land Institute, well, I mean, then the Land Institute bought it, and there were, they had many events there, and it's now been sold again and is owned by a, a private individual. Um, I thought I was making a portrait of Eugene, but clearly I was making a portrait of Whitey. And, uh, and here is Eugene with his dog Trixie and his father Jerry, Eugene and Jerry Thomas, uh, whom I visited often. This is Jerry now, or, or recently, within the last two years. And, and this is Eugene now, with another little dog. And I almost always would see Eugene uh, with an animal, with a small dog of some kind. Um, 
Horses are so beautiful and so hard to photograph, but I, I like this one. I like this eye. And this is um, Chase County in 2009, so this was um, in my more recent work. And uh, Carl, whose mother called him one day, uh, he was over at the um, hardware store where people often stop by to have coffee, and uh, his mother called him and said, I have a twin calf here whose mother has abandoned it. Would you come over and help me take care of it? So he did. And um, a year later, he had his own twins <laughs> and the same hat. And then this is his family um, two years ago, so when the twins were 14. And um, we were talking about those earlier pictures, and his son said, well, Dad, what happened to that hat? And, and Carl said, well, it fell in the bathtub when you were little, and it disintegrated. <laughs> And this is um, my friend Ray Thomas, um, who I actually just exchanged some emails with the uh, day before yesterday. Uh, we still stay in touch. And uh, he has uh, divining rods in his hand. I know that I'm in Kansas. I do not have to explain divining rods. <laughs> I would in Chicago. This is the mailbox and, uh, at Ray's house. And this is um, Evie May's house. She has since died, but she had a, a wonderful garden and a uh, huge garden. You can see it a bit in the distance. And this is uh, Thelma's house. And this is Thelma working. Thelma has also since uh, died. Um, and uh, Mr. Burton. And um, Jean Anderson, is Jean here this evening? So I guess not. Jean wrote me that she was coming. I haven't seen her in probably 15 years. So um, this is Jean and her husband. And um, this train going through um, Chase County. The, the train, of course, runs right along the edge of Matfield Green. Bill McBride has a beautiful bunkhouse and home right by the railroad tracks. And uh, Bill, who's um, restoring Pioneer Bluffs. And so if you have a chance to look at his material outside, um, it's a wonderful, wonderful work that he's doing there. So that was. Um, mother and father and one of their um, four daughters. And again, the um, prairie fires from ab above. And, um, oh, I see so much. Um, this is Eugene, um, Toots's companion, Eugene. This is in 1990, maybe, I don't know, maybe 95. And uh, this is uh, Toots and Eugene now, or very recently. They're both very hardy and strong people. Um, this is a Sherlock Holmes mystery that I saw laying on a counter in Toots's kitchen one day. And um, she had picked it up in one of the abandoned houses. And uh, so I borrowed it and read it and then photographed it. And, and um, I love this photograph. There's something about, it seems to me to be about the mystery of this place of Matfield Green and the surrounding prairie, the mystery of this um, small community with its roots in the prairie and, um, and with its long history and many stories and uh, a mystery that's not a mystery to be solved, but just a mystery to be uh, enjoyed. And Toots again, she was taking me that day to uh, see one of Eugene's pastures where she thought there would be some good vantage points for me to photograph. But when I saw her get out of the truck and look across that way, I knew that was, that was the most important picture of the day. And, uh, and yesterday, when we flew into Wichita, uh, the Flint Hills looked just like this. I mean, what a glorious thing. What an amazing thing that... that 
I would go so far to say it's we have here because I still feel this um, very strong connection and spend so much time here. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, okay, now it's where I want to say something else about Toots. So Toots came to the opening a um, um, month or so ago, and, and I showed this picture, and I was talking about Toots and how she has no vanity, how she let me take this picture, and how wonderful that was. Toots was sitting in the front row, and she stood up, and she turned to the audience, and she said, I wanted to go in and comb my hair. <laughs> But she let me take the picture anyway. Yeah. So that is what is wonderful. And she looks beautiful anyway. Yeah. You know, how many of us could look beautiful with our hair all sweaty from coming in from working? <laughs> <laughs> now I got another story to tell. So uh, I'm going to close with. Um, I made this picture yesterday um, out east of our farmhouse, north of Salina. And um, I just, you know, there's nothing like the Kansas landscape. And I want to read this quote from Barry Lopez from this little book, The Rediscovery of North America. This book was published in 1992. Um, in, in sort of um, same timing as the uh, 500th anniversary of the discovery of America by Columbus and the Spaniards. And uh, this is a, a really lovely book that I recommend to everyone, The Rediscovery of North America by Barry Lopez. And this, this is how I feel about the prairie. When we enter the landscape to learn something, we are obligated, I think, to pay attention rather than constantly to pose questions. To approach the land as we would a person by opening an intelligent conversation. And to stay in one place, to make of that one long observation a fully dilated experience. We will always be rewarded if we give the land credit for more than we imagine, and if we imagine it as being more complex even than language. In these ways we begin, I think, to find a home, to sense how to fit a place. This one also is from yesterday, and this one from last summer. Um, so I have had the challenge and the joy of um, living in Kansas and, uh, and now living in Chicago. Um, but this place, this farmhouse and the surrounding land has been my greatest teacher about, um, about land and landscape and what it means to be in a place. And so this Kansas landscape uh, continues to be um, my great passion. And, um, and it has always been my desire since discovering the prairie back in 1978 to better understand how people and land fit together and how people fit into a place and make a place. Thanks a lot. We have time for question, a few questions, if you have any. Yes? My name is James Mitchell. I think you remember me. I do remember you. Here is this important question that I've asked you. When have you first started photography? I first started in 1968. And I started because Bobby Kennedy came to the University of Kansas, where I was a student. And he um, came, he, it was the day he kicked off his presidential campaign in uh, March of 1968. 
March 19th, to be exact. And, um, and I brought a camera from my father, who was a professional photographer. And so it was this nice looking Nikon. And so because my camera looked like I knew what I was doing, I was allowed to be down on the floor of the field house where he spoke uh, with other press photographers. I don't mean other, I mean with press photographers. I knew nothing. Um, but it was so thrilling to me to find out that I, with a camera I could have access to um, such a situation. <laughs> so that's, that got me going. Yes? Um, I, I do, um, I work, all the work you saw here was done from a Cessna 172. I do a lot of helicopter work around Chicago, but um, that, that was, that was, yes? Um, well, Sam became the um, director of the international division of the YMCA of the USA, so we, we moved there. Any other questions? Yes. I love your aerial uh, shots. And uh, at the Wichita Art Museum, we have a painting, maybe two, I don't know, uh, you can tell me, but uh, uh, we have a painting of, by Yvonne Duquette, who takes aerial photographs of urban landscapes and then turns them into paintings. Uh huh. Well, you know, that's what I always thought, and so I avoided the urban landscape. I it had held no interest for me at all. And then um, one day I was offered um, a, a ride in a hot air balloon in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and I thought, oh, good, I'll get to photograph these hills like uh, Grant Wood painted of Iowa. But um, you can't control where a hot air balloon goes. It just <laughs> goes where it will. And it went over suburbia of uh, Cedar Rapids. And it was fascinating. We were so low. We, we were talking to people on the ground. And I got these pictures I liked very much. And if that hadn't happened, I probably would have turned down what happened next, which was uh, an invitation to do a large aerial project about Chicago. And, um, but because of that hot air balloon ride, I said yes. And no, the urban landscape is fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. So I, that is another whole body of work. Anything else? Well, OK. You didn't ask me. I was hoping you would say, what are you working on now? <laughs> Oh, thanks for asking. <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> I'm working on a project now in North Dakota about the uh, oil boom there, which is um, a huge, huge, huge thing that is happening that is turning the prairie and the people there upside down. And it's a very uh, interesting and, uh, and exciting project that I'm working on in collaboration. Uh, with a woman, Elizabeth Farnsworth, who is a noted journalist uh, who has who worked for many years for the uh, PBS NewsHour as anchor and did a wonderful film called The Judge and the General about Pinochet. So she and I have made now four trips to um, North Dakota. And one of the things that interests me is the, uh, well, the first thing that interests me is that it looks a lot like Chase County. It's just bigger. And, um, but this is uh, along the Upper Missouri River. And Carl Bodmer traveled up there with Maximilian in the 1830s and made lots of paintings. And I've been trying to identify <coughs> roughly some of the sites where he painted. And this looks much like um, an area where he might have painted. And um, there's lots of new housing going on there, but this is, um, a ranch, a, a, a home being built on the land of uh, one of the ranchers that, that we met there. So thanks for asking, Patricia. <laughs>